Okay, this is a video on section 5.3, which is an extension of 5.2. Essentially in 5.2, we had given you the idea of what is an exponential function, which was a number, and the exponent was the variable. We taught you how to solve some equations with that, and we learned how to graph them, and then we also learned some basic word problems. This whole section right here doesn't do anything really new. It just builds upon the fact that there is a special base that we haven't discussed yet, which is a special number called E. E is sort of like pi. It's a decimal that goes on forever with no pattern, doesn't repeat, but it's used a lot for exponential growth and finances. So the natural exponential function is the one that we're talking about, and that is with base E. So we have this formula, I remember from last time, um, this was A equals P, parentheses, 1 plus R over N to the NT, and we said P was principal, R was your annual interest rate as a decimal, N was the number of compoundings, and T was the number of years. The question becomes, what if the rate and the total time investment are fixed, but the interest period is varied? In other words, what if they compound this more and more and more and more and more? So here's an example, compounding quarterly, monthly, weekly, daily, hourly, and every minute. You'll notice that as this happens, this number is not changing drastically, and at a certain point, it the changes happen so far out in the decimal that you see no relative change money-wise. Um, so we got to a point where essentially you don't do anything else. This is considered to be compounded continuously, which is that we um, the number n of time periods per year increases without bound, and we approach a fixed value. So for us, we actually have this chart where they look at, okay, well, what happens if n becomes extremely large? And they use just 1 plus 1 over n to the n, essentially investing $1, 100% return on your money, and you're just worried about the compounding period because it's for one year. So this is kind of just looking at that piece, and they notice that it approaches this decimal number down here, where we kind of don't see much change after this point, especially in the first couple of decimals. This is approaching E. So E is this base 2.71828 is our approximation for it. And we use this now to define the natural exponential function. You should have a button on your calculator that says e to the x or e to the box. This is the button we use to evaluate these. You cannot do them by hand. Well, you, you could try, but it would be very bad um, because you can't write out the decimal long enough. So we're going to show you um, that to graph these, you would need to make a table, um, just like we did for the regular exponentials, and then you would need to use your calculator to get the actual values. Okay, so let's make a table, and I'll show you just how to use the calculator. Depending on the type of calculator you have, some require you to enter the power first and then hit the E button. Some say hit the E button and then your power. You'll just have to play with it to make sure your answer comes out the same. So we're going to go with our standard negative 2 to 2. So I'm going to plug this in as I need to type in E to the negative 2, E to the negative 1, E to the 0, E to the 1, and e squared. So e, let me find my e button. Here it is. Mine says exponential. Yours will say e. This is a standard kind of calculator thing. I believe on these types of calculators I have to type this in first and then hit the exponential. Nope, it did not like that. Uh, nope, there's my e to the x. Sorry, calculators are different depending on how they're structured. So negative 2 is my power. And I did e to the x. Again, you may have to enter e to the x first, then to the negative 2. A quick way to check to see which one it is, I'm going to go ahead and write this down. This is 0.14 if we round to two decimal places. If you want to double check to see if this is being done right, just put in the first power of e to the x, and you should get the 2.71828 that we said is the estimate. So that means the first power was 2.7. Let's do e to the negative 1, so that's 0.37, anything to the 0 power is 1, so we just need e squared. So 2 is my exponent, so that's 7.4. So then we would plot these, 
and you're going to notice this still looks like an exponential function. It essentially is. It just has a base that is not an integer. But you get the same generic shape we did for all of our other exponentials. So the only thing you really have to know how to do is to use the E button on your calculator and you can still graph these. And we still have the horizontal asymptote of y equals zero. Okay, so essentially we can, I'm just looking at these, um, we can still graph these guys using the table or you could think about transformations. Um, for example, this is just a reflection over the y-axis, or excuse me, the x-axis. Too, too late to talk. Um, so that means that I get the same points I just had a second ago, except they're reflected upside down. So I'm going to save myself some time here on this one. You could do the table of values to prove this, but you would see that everything is just flip-flopped upside down. I will show you the table for a couple other ones. Um, so this is like 2 times e to the x. Essentially this is stretching it so it's going to grow faster. So if we do our negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, I'm going to use my calculator. So I need to do uh, negative 2 is my exponent, e to the negative 2, and then I multiply the whole thing by 2, so that's 0.27. And then I would do my exponent as negative 1, e times the 2 out front is 0.74. Then we have a power of 0, which is going to give us a 1, of course. And then we times that by 2, so that would be 2. Uh, power of 1, which is the 2.718, times the 2 out front would be 5.4. And e squared, and then times by 2 out front, would be 14.8, which is off my paper. So negative 2, 2.7, negative 1, 7.4, 0, 2, 1, 5.4. You just notice that this one gets steeper faster. Not much, but enough to say, okay, it was stretched. And then this guy is a shift up 4, which means it will change your horizontal asymptote. I'm not going to do the table for this one. There's not much going on. Uh, but if you do have an exponential, exponentials have horizontal asymptotes, and they will move with vertical shifts. So that means this horizontal asymptote would be at positive 4. Um, the only thing that I'm going to say about D, I actually I guess I could do this one since the table's a little funny, is that remember this has been changing your exponent, so I actually want to plug in negative 4 as the middle of my table, just to get things to work out nice. Pick two things um, bigger and two things smaller. This is e to the negative 2 plus 4, which would be e squared. This is e to the negative 2, or negative 3 plus 4, which is e to the first. e to the negative 4 plus 4 is e to the 0. e to the negative 5 plus 4 is e to the negative 1. e to the negative 6 plus 4 is e to the negative 2. Uh, we already know the answers for all of these from up above. When we did the first graph, so the negative 2 power was 1.14, so that matches with this one. So we're just making it kind of match the y values we want, but it's changing the x's for us. And then 0.37 was the next one, just without going back to my calculator. Anything to the 0 power is 1. e to the first is 2.7, and then e to the second was the 7.4. So you'll notice this graph is getting shifted, but the horizontal asymptote actually stays the same. So negative 2, 7.4, negative, negative 2, 7.4, negative 3, 2.7, and negative 4, negative uh, positive 1, 
negative 5 is a really small decimal and so is negative 6. So notice the graph was shifted to the left 4 and the horizontal asymptote stayed the same. The horizontal asymptote shifts, remember this one, because you're adding or subtracting to your y value. So this guy essentially ends up looking like this. And then this kind of goes, same pattern as before, but I don't have the points in there. Okay, um, oops, excuse me. This guy right here is a variation of what we just learned in the last section in 5.2. If you have same base, then you can set one on each side and it's an equal sign, you can set the powers equal. So E is the same base, so this is just 3x equals 2x minus 1. Subtract over the x and we get x equals negative 1. Um, this is different. If you are compounding continuously, which means you have uh, your compounding periods are continuously getting larger, we have a special formula for that called PERT. So when your money is being continuously compounded, you use the E base and you still have your principal, your rate is a decimal, and your time, but R and T are both multiple, uh, multiplied together as an exponent on E. And it's a very specific case. So it only happens if you're compounding continuously. So if $100 is deposited in a savings account that pays interest at 6.5, so that would be 0 0.065 as a decimal, so that's my uh, R, P is my uh, deposit, and we're compounding continuously, which means we're using PERT as our formula. How much will we have in our account after 10 years? So A equals principal, E is a base, you actually have to write it in, and 0 0.065 times 10. I usually work my uh, exponent out first. 10 times anything just moves the decimal one place, so it would be 0.65. So 0.65e times 100. After 10 years, we'd have $191.55 as our balance. Now, if they asked you how much interest did you earn, you would subtract the $100 you originally deposited, and so we've earned $91.55 in interest. Um, how much money should we invest at an interest rate of 5.5 compounded continuously if we want $15,000 after four years? So $15,000 is our actual future value. Uh, T is four years, and this would be 0 .055 for the rate. So we don't know P. I remember we said uh, in my last video, if you are looking for P, you have to round up. So A equals P E R T because it's continuously. So 15,000 equals P E to the 0 .055 times 4. I'm going to go ahead and work out that uh, exponent. That is 0.22. So I'm going to divide over to solve for P. So 15,000 divided by e to the 0.22 is going to be our approximation for p. And I'm doing something funny here. If you're ever trying to work backwards from a fraction, you're on a calculator that has this button, you can do the denominator first and then flip it to make it actually show up in the denominator and then times it by the top. Just a cool trick, but it's easier to type it in straight on your calculator. So that's $12,037 and we're going to round this up to $0.79 cents because we round up no matter what when we solve for P. So $12,037.79. That's how much you'd have to invest if you want to get $15,000. So you pretty much have to have almost all the money because you have a pretty low interest rate. Okay, this is the law of growth or decay formula. This helps us with some more radioactive stuff or half-lives. Um, if you have an initial quantity and you have a unit of time, Q will change instantaneously at a rate proportional to its current value. If that's true, then your formula is your future value at some time is the initial times e to the rt. Essentially, they're using the PERT formula, but they're saying it's not just for money anymore. Population kind of follows this, this model a lot of times. 
So in 1985, the population estimate for India was 766 million. The population has been growing continuously at a rate of about 1.82% per year. Assuming that this rapid growth rate will continue, which of course will not usually happen, um, what would be the population N of T of India in 2015? So this would be N of T equals N sub 0 e to the RT. So this is our initial population. Our rate as a decimal would be 0 0.0182. Um, we need our time. So it was 1985 to 2015. So we're going to have to subtract to find that value, which would be 30 years. So T is 30. And we're ready to plug in. So N sub T, or N of T is 766 million. You might want to put that in with the zeros, just so your answer comes out making more sense. E to the 0 0.0182 times 30. I would probably work my decimal out first. That's 0.456, easier to type in. So 0.456, I think that's what I said. No, 546. 546 e power times the 766, and then it's millions. So we need six zeros behind that. And that gives us one three two two three seven one okay so let me write this down one three two two three seven one seven three one and we could round up so we could say seven three two so this looks like we have an estimate of about one point three billion if the rate continued. Okay, this next one was what I was talking about, um, half-lives and understanding how they order medicine and sometimes because it has a decay rate. So this radioactive tracer 51CR can be used to locate the position of the placenta in a pregnant woman in case they're worried about it not being in a safe location. Often the tracer must be ordered from a medical laboratory. If A subunits or microcuries are shipped, then because of radioactive decay, the number of units A of T present after T days will be given by A of T equals A sub 0 e to the negative 0 0.0249 times T. This is your percentage of decay per day. So um, that's that decimal right there that they're giving you. So we're trying to figure out if we're making an order or if we need something, how would you do this? So if you need 35, oh, so if 35 units are shipped, so that would be our initial amount, and it takes two days for it to arrive, how many units will be available for the test? So A of 2 equals 35 e to the negative 0 0.0249 times 2, so 0 0.0 get my decimal, 249 times 2, I know this is negative, so that's negative 0 0.0498, that's going to be my uh, exponent that I plug in, so we need to make it negative, raise it to e to the x, times 35, and we get 33.29, which we would not usually use half of a unit or even a partial of a unit. So there's approximately 33 units left because you can't use a partial unit. So somebody made a mistake. Essentially, they needed all 35 units for the test. Um, how many should they have ordered if we still know it takes two days to get there? So this is going to be our end result now. So 35 equals a sub 0, e to the negative 0 0.0249 times 2, which we already know is an exponent 
of that. In this case, we would be dividing that over to solve for a sub 0. So 35 divided by parentheses, since I'm using this calculator, uh, point 0 0.0498, which is a negative exponent. Oh, nope. Did not like my decimal. Point zero four nine eight negative e to the x and hit enter. We needed about thirty seven units because you can't you, you can't round down to thirty six again. You would not have enough if it arrived. So we have to round up, and we're also solving for initial amount. So this is how you would use your base E, your calculator to do base E, and that's how it all ties into the exponentials that we already learned about.